why don't you, uh, why don't you turn to somebody and say, buckle up. Go ahead, turn to somebody and say, buckle up. Go ahead. Everybody just go ahead and figuratively put on your seatbelt. Let me hear you. Click, click, click. Clickety, click, click, click. How many of you hate seatbelts? You know, how many of you, I mean, forever. Yeah, some of you, okay, some of you. Does anybody in here cheat the seatbelt system? Do you take the seatbelt? One honest man. And um, he, you put the seatbelt in and you leave it that way. And when you get in the car, you sit in front of it and it just stays because you never hear beep, beep, beep. And, and you start to drive off and it doesn't beep. And you're like, ha, 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 I tricked you, I tricked you. Listen, I just say, put on your seatbelt, wear your seatbelt. Okay. So um, buckle up. Here, you know, in, in the course of ministry, in the course of, of um, any given year, the things that we talk about and preach on, some of the things are more um, easily engaged. They're more uh, excitedly engaged. Like, oh yeah, you know, and, uh, starting 416, we're gonna start a, a series. We're gonna look at relationships. And typically that's a series people are like, yes, because it's very tangible and practical. I'm in a relationship. I want a relationship. My relationship is messy. It's broken or whatever. Like, so, so normally, Normally, people are like, yes. And some series, when we get into them, people are like, I don't love that one a whole lot. That one, he's talking about me. I think I need to go fishing this weekend. You know what I'm saying? And, um, and so that happens all the time. And typically, a series like The Elephant in the Room is one of those series. We talk about stewardship, financial management, biblical model for money management. And people are like, God, keep your hands off my money. And, um, and, 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 but everybody who stays engaged, this is just my experience through 17 years of teaching out of the Bible on a variety of subjects, this being one that all, I mean, every single year there are people who come through this series and get to the other side and go, oh, I was scared. I, I entered the series like this, like this. Everybody close your hands. Just make a fist. Come on, make a fist, make a fist. Don't hit anybody, but make a fist. Okay, white knuckled moment. You enter the series like, oh, what you gonna say? Oh my gosh, please keep your hands wet. And by the third or fourth week, they're like this. And they're not necessarily like this, but, but, the, but the tension is gone. And I want to tell you what I hope has been your journey over the first two weeks before we dive into this third week. Is I hope that what you have recognized is that God's desire is for you in everything, including financial provision. The Bible is for you. In every way. God is wanting to refine us, grow us. Sometimes there's discipline involved. Sometimes there's pruning involved. But the ultimate outcome is to grow and make us more into the likeness of Christ and to walk in the fullness of his design. Like that, that's what we're doing here. And so as we do that, we begin to live brightly in front of a world. We live the gospel out daily. Our life begins to feel fulfillment and sense the presence of God in new ways. And that includes financial stewardship. And so my hope is that over these first two weeks, you've taken kind of some steps in, in oh, okay, I can trust the Bible. Even when it's a little prickly, I can trust it. And so today we're gonna talk about um, uh, kind of the next step in our journey. Has anybody, my, my wife, we live in an apartment in, in Worcester right now, and um, we live on the second floor. And so whenever we, my wife comes home with groceries, we have to make the trip up and down. Anybody ever have that experience, right? You live on the second floor or third floor of an apartment or whatever. Maybe you have a long driveway and you're, or a detached garage. And so you have to make the trips out and down and around and get all the stuff and carry it to the place. And um, sometimes we go do that, right? We, we grab 16 bags. Anybody do this? You're like trying... 16 is a lot of bags. I'm just saying, I'm working on a new record, but we're going to get there. You grab a lot of bags. And then there's that one that you really also, it's like there's one left in the trunk. Anybody? Come on, somebody. There's one left in the trunk and you got all the bags and they're heavy and you try and weigh them right and make sure you can. <sighs> and on the way up, if you're a man, it's a trap day. Just it's a trap day, a trap, right? And so, but there's one left, and you're like, I don't want to make the trip back. I don't want to have to go back to the car. So you, you try and get your pinky out. Come on, anybody? And you try and get that pinky out and you go and you got all these bags. You're like, oh. Oh. I'm telling you that for most of us, our pinky is the strongest finger on our hand. You've worked that thing out. And you hook that thing and you, you I mean, it's, it's, you're cramping and you're like, I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna get there. Oh. And you get to the apartment, you open the door. How, you don't open it, obviously, but somebody opens the door. You leave the door, you walk in, you're like, right? <laughs> well, here's the thing. If you're, if, if, if you're like us, we've had times where the bags break. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is a, everybody's like, oh, I knew I came to church for, for freedom today. <laughs> 
You have moments where the bags break. And sometimes that's happened where the bag, you know, stuff falls out in the trunk, whatever. And you start to try and carry it all in your arms. And you grab the, the mayonnaise and the ketchup and the, and the green beans and you're trying to get the thing and you, just, you got an armful. And you get to the place where no one can put anything else in your hands. You have no more room to carry. You have picked up as much as you can. And in our, you know, our this illustration right now, of course, the goal is to get to the upstairs where you're gonna dump it all on the counter or whatever. But your arms are so full, there's no more room for you to carry anything. And today I wanna to talk to you about this, this idea that I, 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 this idea of having so much and trying to hold so much that nothing else can be given to you. You and me, we're preaching today. <laughs> All right, here's your big idea. Write this down. Go ahead. In fact, everybody do me a favor. Wave a Bible at me. Wave a phone at me. Wave something at me. You got, you, hopefully you have your Bible in here. Wave something. Wave your, wave your neighbor's paper. Steal it. I got your paper. I just, whatever. Wave something at me. I want you to take some notes. We, we believe note takers go to heaven and non-note takers also go to heaven. That's what we're saying. <laughs> So, uh, but take some notes today. I think this will, will set you free. My, my challenge, uh, really, I'll just tell you at the outset, I'm gonna challenge you a little bit today to break out of, to, to apply what we've talked about in the first two weeks, that God is our source and we are stewards of all that he's put in our hands. And I'm gonna challenge you to apply it today. I'm gonna teach you some things out of the Old Testament, a system out of the Old Testament and how the principles apply today, not the law. That's where we're going. But write this down. This is your big idea. When what God expects to leave our hands stays in our hands, we prevent God from pouring more through our hands. When what God expects to leave your hands stays in them, God can't put anything else in them. Open your Bible to 2 Corinthians 9. Uh, I should hear pages flipping right now, just so you know. Second Corinthians chapter nine. We're gonna read something together here. Now, in Second Corinthians chapter nine, there's a collection taking place for Christians in Jerusalem. So we, we see this several times in the New Testament that there is a collection, uh, there's a collection that takes place in different places. And the collection is not always for the place that they are. In, in the book of Acts, when the New Testament church is established, uh, we see the believers, you know, the Bible says on the day of Pentecost that Peter preached this message and um, thousands of people came to, came to the saving knowledge of Jesus that day. Like they, they got saved that day. And, and from that point forward, they begin to operate differently than they had operated before. And some of that has to do with a transition from uh, an Old Testament model to a New Testament model of generosity. And so we're gonna unpack that a little bit. But one of the places that that happens is in 2 Corinthians chapter nine. And there's a principle here that I wanna read to you. So what is taking place is they're taking a collection uh, and they're gonna send it to Jerusalem, the Jerusalem believers who were in need. And so Paul has been coaching them, writing to them, and he's sending someone to collect it and all that. But there are a couple of principles that Paul highlights here in 2 Corinthians 9. I want to read them to you. I'm going to begin reading in verse 6, and then we'll get down to verses 10 and 11 in particular. And I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. It says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Has anybody ever planted anything? Like you planted fruit or you planted green beans. Anybody ever done any vegetable or fruit you know, gardening at all? Okay. Has anybody ever killed every plant you tried? To... More hands went up, which means more of you have planted stuff than you acknowledged on the front end. Janelle and I have tried to have a garden a couple times in our life. And um, when I'm involved, I, I do a good job at getting the frame built and the dirt put in it. And then I need to keep my hands off it. Because uh, otherwise everything dies. Anyway, those who sow sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now this is on the heels of the collection they're taking up for Jerusalem. He's, he's given them some coaching on this and then he gives this principle. I'm coming, to, I'm coming to collect the offering that we're taking to Jerusalem and just remember how God and the economy of God works. Then he says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Everybody say, yay. yay. All right. How many of you, when it's time to give, you go, yay. <laughs> Everybody laughed. No one said yay. That was really interesting. Um, for God loves a cheerful giver. 
Verse eight, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things, everybody say all. All, all sufficiency in all things and at all times. You may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Verse 10, it says, he who supplies seed to the sower. We're going to keep reading here for a second. But he who supplies seed to the sower. Have you ever, you ever given somebody, um, um, I don't know, a gift of some kind and, and they never used the gift you gave them? They never wore the shirt. They never put on the shoes. They never used the gift card. They never went and you know, got the facial. Like whatever you gave them, they never actually used what you gave them. Have you ever had that happen? Can I ask a question? How do you feel when that happens? Lousy. I gave you a gift. I'm not mad at you. I gave it to you. You can do what you want, but it sure feels like a waste. I took the time to get the thing to put in your hand and tell you I'm concerned about you. I'm thinking about you. I love you. I, I want you to feel blessing. I want you to experience joy, whatever. I put it in your hand and then you put it over there and never did with it what was intended to be done with it. You didn't put the shirt on and wear it. You didn't, you didn't even try and return it and get one you like so you would. You just let it be wasting away. The person who gave the gift feels a sense of disappointment uh, and, 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 and the, the responsibility is released. It's yours, but there is a, ugh, it goes on in us. And I want you to take that and let's go to our garden. Let's say that someone showed up at your house. You, they heard you say that you wanted to plant a garden. And someone showed up at your house and they walked up, they, they knocked on your door and said, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. They took you outside and in the back of their car, their truck, their SUV, were bags of seed. And they got out bags of seed for you to use for the different things you wanted to put in your garden. Now, I know some of the things, these little tiny packets, but you know, maybe they brought a small bat, whatever. They're like, I wanna give you all the seed you need for your garden. And if you need more, let me know. First of all, you'd be like, sweet. And then they'd help you get all that stuff near the garden or in your garage or whatever. Now, the seed sits there. It's in your garage. It is now yours. You have the privilege and the responsibility and the freedom to do with it what you will. If the seed stays in the garage and never gets scattered into the ground, never gets sown, what does the person who gave you the seed think? They either think you're irresponsible or they're insulted or they think you still have everything you need. And so the idea of providing more seed is connected to the idea that you have to be a sower. So when the Bible says, he who supplies seed to the sower, it doesn't just say he who supplies seed ongoingly forever and ever. He said, it says he who supplies seed to the one who's sowing. If we are not sowers, our prayer for God to give us more seed is unlikely to be fulfilled from the hand of the Lord simply because we've said, you've already given me seed, but I'm not sowing any of it. I'm continuing to try and figure out how to keep more in my hands. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and, everybody say it, multiply, increase, multiply, faithfulness, increase. He will increase and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way. Everybody say every way. Enriched in every way. How many can think of some ways you'd like the Lord to enrich you? If you can't think of any, you can't think of any, I don't think you know your God. God's desire is to enrich you. Now, we often use that word enrich to think of rich wealth, you know, Lear jets and you know, all that. Like that's not, that's not, what, don't misapply the word. The word includes financial provision, but enrich you, like re, how many of you have ever thought about your relationships as a measure of richness? Because of who I'm connected to, because of who God's put in my life, because of what they add to me, I feel rich in my relationships. There's lots of ways that the Lord wants to enrich us. It's not just economic. You will be enriched in every way for what purpose? To be generous so that you can be generous. 
In other words, God is all about perpetuating the sowing of seed. He's interested in putting the seed in your hand to find out if you'll sow it because the more you sow, the more both you reap and he can trust you to sow to help everybody because in his enrichment of us, we can be generous when? On every occasion. Ooh, it is so quiet in church today. <laughs> Which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. In other words, the process of provision for sowing and returning that yields a harvest in us and in others through generosity based on the provision of seed yields to thanksgiving to God. Have you ever, you ever been generous with someone and have them say, my gosh, God used you to answer my prayer. Have you ever have a moment like that? If you haven't, you are missing out on one of the most amazing moments in your walk with the Lord. When he, when he speaks to you about how to help somebody, be generous to somebody, do something with someone, and they respond to you if they know it's you, because sometimes they don't know it's you, or they share the testimony, they share with others, you hear so and so, God answered their prayer. I mentioned last week that through the years, I remember as a kid, my parents had, there were times where we were able to do for others, and there were times where we had groceries delivered to our doorstep. And those moments when my parents would say things and have said since to me, like we were praying to the Lord. We didn't know how we were all gonna eat. And then this happened. Okay. The Lord wants to provide seed for sowing and increase the store so we can be generous on every occasion. So when we talk about giving in the church, I wanna give you this, this, this baseline so I can help you kind of navigate what is typically some semantics in the context of uh, church and in generosity, particularly in the area of giving in the local church. So most people have kind of a, a, a casual understanding of the idea of giving and even of the idea of tithing. And so I wanna, I wanna teach you about it because the Old Testament system or structure of, of giving, what we would call giving, was, was, it was, it was more complex than simply saying they tied. There was more to it than that. And so I'm gonna give you some framework for it. But there's a, a Hebrew word, the, 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 kind of the Jewish concept of zedakah is this practice of generosity from the first fruits through three different tithes. Now there are a number of different ways that things took place in the Jewish community, but I wanna unpack these four things quickly for you because they are the framework for what we do in the way we operate today. So the first thing is this, first fruits is um, not the same thing as a tithe. And, and we have used those words sometimes, it sounds interchangeably, we've said return the first fruits, return the tithe. We say those things, those are Old Testament terms. And the reason we use those words is because when we say give, when we give, the implication is that it is mine. But the New Testament model, we've talked about this already in the series, is that everything that is in our life, from our gifts and skills, to our bank accounts, to our homes, to our cars, is the Lord's, everything is the Lord's. So you can't give something that isn't yours. If I take, uh, you know, Kurt's wallet and I, I look in it and take those several hundred dollar bills he carries around, right, Kurt? Sure. sure, okay. And I go over here and I give that money to Reeve and, some, and, and Reeve says, thank you for giving it to me. And I say, yeah, you're welcome as if it was mine to give. All of you would say, you're not a giver, you're a thief. You took something else from someone else and you put it in someone else's hands and allowed them to believe that you were giving it to them when you weren't. You, you stole something and put it in their hands. Only, only the owner of the thing can be a giver. And so the reason we, we often use the words tithe or first fruits is because it helps connect us to the idea that everything is the Lord's. When we say giving, it sounds like we are giving out of what is ours. Now, I believe there is a, a place at which it is free will and our choice to give, but I believe there are also, uh, there's some expectation of the Lord in how we operate. And we'll see that here quickly. So, Zedekah, the first thing in, in kind of this process is what is called the first fruits. And in the Old Testament, first fruits, there's a word called the teroma, which was the wave offering, the heave offering, or it was a tribute. And so I want you to write this down. First fruits power is in their being released, not retained. The power of the first fruit is in the giving away of it. It's the, pro it's the practice of sowing. 
And so in the Old Testament, there were you know, several harvests that would take place during the year. And the first portion, which was between 140th and 160th of your harvest, so somewhere between one and a half and two and a half percent of your first harvest, the Bikurim, was taken, it was packaged up and taken to the temple. It was your first fruits. You returned the first one and a half to two and a half percent of it. Um, this tarum or, or wave was the, the first fruits of your harvest. And um, everybody did it. It was, the, it was the expected practice. And the reasons inside of that, which we can find all throughout the book of Exodus, Leviticus, you can go read about this if you want to, was that you would take the Bikurim and you would go and find the priest, the local priest. If it was too far for you to go to get to a priest, you would go to the father of your house who was considered the priest of his home. And you would ask for it to be prayed over and blessed. And at the moment that that, that took place, that you, were, you, you took it and you, you, you went to have it blessed, it became this teruma, a, a lifted up wave offering. It was lifted up before the Lord. And in the moment that the priest blessed what you brought, the first fruits, the blessing extended to all that remained. And when, we did, when, when, when Hebrews would neglect the first fruits, what we find in the scriptures is that everything in the rest of their harvests was cursed. And that, we use that word cursed in a, kind of a super casual way today. Um, like, oh, I'm put a curse on you. Like we, we've watered down the magnitude of things like blessing and cursing. Like there's a, there's a lot about the practice of what God does in blessing and the, the cursing that exists when we don't seek the Lord. And so what would happen is that um, you would bring it to the Lord and then um, the, the Hebrews actually believed that the priest that blessed it played a part in it. You would never take it to a poor priest. I don't mean poor economically. I mean someone who didn't, who didn't, who didn't perform their priestly duties responsibly. You would, in fact, in Ezekiel 44, we read about, you would take it and, and take it to one of the priests in the temple that you believed and trusted, knew how to bless and pray and, and, and intercede on your behalf. Have, and they would, they would pray over it, receive the first fruits, which was, to, which was to take care of the house of God. And we see this practice played out. Jesus says some things that, that um, we connect to this practice. In John chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus says, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Luke chapter 23, verse 46 says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. There's a, there's a New Testament parallel between the first fruit practice in the Old Testament and the transition to bringing responsible trust of God into the New Testament. So first fruits was this, this the, the first portion between one and a half and two percent. Now the reason that matters is because last week we read a passage in, in Matthew chapter six and we talked about, uh, and I said this to you in the portion where Jesus says, you know, if your eye is evil, your whole body is full of darkness. But if your eyes is, is, is um, not evil, is, is, is full of light, right? This, this portion where Jesus is speaking about what is coming out of us and the way we think. Actually, you know, a, a Hebrew scholar, Hillel, a, go, you can go and, and find all you want to about him, but he wrote in, in uh, you know, I don't know, hundreds of years before Jesus, that for those who only return one and a half percent of the first fruits, it's like being a person with an evil eye. It's a person who wants to do the bare minimum to seek God. And a person who returns the two and a half percent is someone whose eye, eye is full of light. And then Jesus puts that phrase in the middle of a portion of scripture about generosity. And so we see in the Old Testament, the practice is to return the first fruits. Now that's not the tithe. In the Old Testament, there are three different tithes. And the first one is normally the one we talk about. Normally when we say, hey, we should be a tither, what we mean is this first tithe, which in the Hebrew is Maseer Rishon, and it means um, it, it's the Lord's tithe or the first tithe. And this is the classic tithe. So after the Hebrews would give the Bikurim, the, the first fruits, they would then, after that, measure out 10%. And every year, excuse me, not every year, years one and two, years four and five, they would bring the first tenth to the temple. And the purpose of the first tenth was to take care of the temple. In fact, I wrote it this way. You can write this down. Giving, and I'm using the word giving intentionally right now instead of the word tithing. I want you to understand that we're out from under the law of the tithe. We do not believe that the law of the tithe applies. We believe the principle of the tithe carries forward into the New Testament. In fact, it's extended, and I'll read you that as we get further along. So giving effectuates gospel teaching and care being given to others who are with me. 
Giving is what effectuates gospel teaching and care being given to others for, who are with me. In other words, the Hebrews returned the first tenth to the local temple, and out of that place, it's where the business of the community of faith took place. I don't mean the business. I mean weddings and funerals and community and care and baptism and discipleship and teaching and like that's where it happened. So the first portion after the first fruits was returned to the temple in years one, two, four, and six. Say, hey, Pastor David, that's, that's kind of weird. Well, the Hebrews had a seven-year cycle for giving. Seven-year cycle for giving. The first year, they would give the first fruits and the first tithe. The second year, they would give the first fruits and the, and, and the, 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 the second tithe. We'll talk about that. And then every third year, they would use the second tithe and they would make, give it in a different context called the third tithe. So let me give these to you quickly. Giving effectuates giving, uh, excuse me, gospel teaching and care being given to others who are with me. I want you to look at the person beside you. Just go ahead, look to the person to the left or right. Go ahead. Go ahead, look. Some of the husbands and wives are like, oh, I get to look at you again. <laughs> An Andrew and Andrea moment right there. Here's the thing. What that means is that the people next to you are helping ensure that you are cared for, discipled, your kids are looked out for, the ministry of the local church takes place. So when you look at someone else and, and, and you are not a giver, if you are not a giver to the local church, but you are receiving from the local church, you need, you need to connect the idea of your sowing and your reaping and your receiving. Like you need to have an honest conversation with yourself. If you don't believe that, that this church cares for, disciples, looks after, plays a part in the journey of people in their walk with Jesus, then you need to be in a church where you do believe that because you're expected to participate in the community. If everybody just was a receiver, there would be no church. There would be no kids ministry for your children. There would be no prayer over people at Worship Wednesday. There would be no home visitation or small group creation or Youth ministry, like pick a thing. It wouldn't exist if everybody simply decided they were the one who was going to receive and not participate, which is why I say you need to be a giver here or somewhere for your sake. The, because what that means is you filled your hands and you have never set anything down or let anything go. And it is preventing God from doing more through you. Look at the person on the other side and say, that was kind of direct. Go ahead. <laughs> when I've said that in the past at times and just said to people, listen, I love you. I don't, I don't want anybody to leave our church, but I want you to own your faith. And part of owning your faith is returning to the local church. Not physically, although that too, but it's participating in the, in the community tangibly. And that's by your giving. So the first tithe happened, uh, it, was, it was what we would be familiar with. Um, and it was, you know, the Lord's tithe or, um, this is kind of the, the classic 10% idea. The second tithe is called Masa'er Shani, and it's the redeemed tithe or the tithe of feasts. And this, interestingly, was actually a mandated tithe that really was your savings account. It was a mandated second 10%. Remember last week I, or two weeks ago, I talked about 80, 10, 10, that whole process. Um, well, the first tithe is 10% that is returned to the local church. The second 10th is actually saved. And there's two purposes. You can do a couple of things with it. You can either save it and let it accumulate, or you can utilize it for vacation, literally. Pilgrimage to Jerusalem. You could go, go to the city, take your family on vacation, and you were literally saving, preparing with the second tithe for that purpose. I love that God mandated that. That's awesome. And so the first, the first tithe was the Lord's tithe. The second tithe was this kind of re, the redeemed tithe or the tithe of feasts. It was for the purpose of feasting, vacation, pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And obviously, if you think about that, kind of this self-consumption, uh, mandated provision for self-consumption. If you saved all of that, you know, if you took that second 10% and saved it all of your life, based on median income and average stock market and all that kind of stuff, not the 2022 stock market, I'm just saying the numbers would be somewhere north of $3 million. And if your family continued that through generations, that is, that is God has designed a system for generational accumulation. But it is very much based on the fact that we trust the Lord's system. So this, the first tithe was, was for the local church. The second tithe was what we would call maybe a, 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 a self-tithe. And every third year, Israelites were, were to take the self-tithe and apply it a different way. It's called ma'aser ani, and it's the poor man's tithe. The poor man's tithe. And that sounds like what they're saying is, 
poor people can't tithe. But what they're actually saying is that the, every third year, the tithe you would set aside for yourself, you would give that entire tithe to the local temple so that it could provide for widows, orphans, people who'd lost their crops, they'd had a famine, something devastating had happened, and that the local temple was capable of caring for the community. So every third year, you would not save 10% for self. You would give that, that 10% to the temple for that purpose. Now, remember I said there was a seven-year system in the Hebrew kind of system, and um, tzedakah means righteousness. It's actually, it came to be known as the system of response to the righteousness of God. And what would happen is every seven years, it would look like this. Years one and two, you've got tithes one and two after the first fruits. In year three, you would have tithes one and two, but tithe number two became return to the local church to care for people. And then years, years four, you would have tithe one and first fruits, and you would save 10 percent, the second tithe for yourself. And you're, uh, that's four. And then five, year five, you would do the same thing. Then year six, you would have first fruits and the, the, the first tithe, the Lord's tithe, but the second tithe, you would return to take care of the people in the community. And then in year seven, year seven, it's just the first fruits. So whatever else was there, you did whatever you, whatever you chose to do. You let everything lie. You let the ground lie, you let animals lie. Like it was, it was this, 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 this resting year. And I thought, man, what an interesting system that God created. And that now under the law in the Old Testament, and by the way, the whole practice of the tithe precedes the law, but under the law in the Old Testament, if you didn't do those things, several things happen. You, you'd be in trouble with your community. You'd also be in trouble at the temple. But the bigger deal was that you would be out of relationship with God. You'd be under the, the penalty of the law. But in the New Testament, the law is done away with. Jesus fulfilled the law of sin and death. And what that means is that Jesus did not abolish all practice of the law. I mean, none of us believe that murder has been done away with, do we? Does anybody believe that adultery has been done away with? Or lying? Like, there's lots of things that we accept that carried forward from the Old Testament to the New Testament out of Hebrew law into New Testament, which is a grace covenant. It's not a law covenant, but that moved forward from Old Testament to New Testament. And so we often, Lifesong Church has often said, we believe that returning the first 10% to the local church is the biblical standard for giving. And I do believe that. I absolutely believe that. That is different than saying that if you don't return the first 10%, you're under a curse from God. That's not the same thing. But in the New Testament, God actually raises the bar on generosity and everything else for that matter. In the New Testament, God says, uh, Jesus is speaking in the Sermon on the Mountain. He says things like, um, you know, if you, uh, you shouldn't have adultery. Moses says you shouldn't have adultery. But I say if you've taken a woman in your heart, you've as much as committed the act. You shouldn't murder, but if you hate your brother in your heart, you've as much as done it. Jesus raised the bar on everything in the New Testament. And he confronted legalism repeatedly. And so what I, what I want to help you understand is this, the third tithe, you can write this down, is giving that helps deliver the gospel to the world well beyond me. So the first portion of giving is given for the sake of caring for the local house, the people, the community, the, the staff that lead and, and, and facilitate ministry. All of that is handled by the first fruits and the first tithe it is the Old Testament model. And so the principle is the first portion of your generosity goes to the local church. The, the principle beyond that is that the, the next portion of generosity goes to help the world beyond us. And we do that. Pastor Paul mentioned earlier what we do through Pando, a portion of all the giving that comes here and a large portion of all the legacy giving goes out of our hands to the world around us. So while we don't collect the first tithe and a second tithe and a first fruit and the thing, and blah, 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 we do follow the principles of the Old Testament in taking what is returned to the local church by the body who the Lord has provided the seed to for you to sow that seed and the first portion of your seed goes to the house of God to care for the people of God and then extend beyond the four walls of the church. That's the principle that we apply in the New Testament. In fact, Jacob in the Old Testament in Genesis 28 said, uh, of all that you give me, God, I will surely give a tenth to you. In Luke chapter six, verse 38, we read the, the, this passage and, and you've heard it. It talks about, um, you know, don't judge lest you be judged. How many like that line? Don't judge lest you be judged. None of you like that line? I love that line. Don't judge lest you be judged, right? It, if you forgive others, you'll be forgiven. If you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. 
It says, give and it will be given to you. And then there's a statement about how that works. All of those things, not just giving. It says, um, and give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, will it be given to you. So here's what that means. That means if you are a judger, that what, the, what will happen in the nature, because sowing, whatever you sow, you will reap. Whatever we sow, we will reap. Whatever we sow. Look at the person beside you and say, whatever you sow, you will reap. So if you sow judgment, the Bible says that you will have judgment poured into a cup, a good amount of it. It'll be, you ever do that with flour or sugar or something? You know, you put something in a cup, a dry ingredient, you like, like pack it down, right? It's a good measure, pressed down, like shaken and settled so you can fit a little bit more in. In other words, the Lord says, you think the amount of judgment you poured out is a lot? The judgment you'll receive back will be the amount put in a cup, like really packed in good. And that's what you'll get. Judgment, forgiveness, and giving. Given it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together. And so what do we do with with all of this, here's what I want you to hear today and, and we'll close, is that trusting God by returning the first, and again, I, I have hopefully connected the dots of the practice in the Old Testament for you to understand a little better than just you hearing this word tithe. There's a far broader application of how God wanted to care for the Hebrew people as his children. There's a practice. I've, I've given everything to you. Here's what I want you to do with it. And then the other 80% is yours, or actually 78.5% or whatever it is. Do whatever you want to with it. God's practice was to care for his people and provide all that he needs because 10% of one person's small crop plus 10% of someone else's big crop plus 10% of someone else's starter crop plus 10% of someone else's 27 acres of crops. It, like, all, but collectively, there would be more than enough for care, to, to care for all of Israel. But if only the people, only some people, a couple of people who had a lot, a couple of people who had a little, gave everything, that, right? How many of you have heard the, the verse in Malachi? God says, you know, um, how will a mortal man rob God? Here's how you've robbed me in tithes and offerings. Bring, listen what he says. He says, bring the whole tithe into my storehouse. He says, that there may be food in my house. Return everything that the people of God can eat. They can be cared for. They can be taken care of. They can gather together. They can live together. They can do life together. The temple was the place where we took care of the people of God. And so here's what I want you to just think about as you, as you step out today. Giving is a personal test of what has captured our heart. Giving is a personal test. What actually has your heart? Matthew chapter six is where your treasure is. There will your heart be. Wherever you put what has come into your hands will be the place your heart is deeply connected. Whether that's the local church, whether that's your credit card, whether that's a, a ministry across the country, whether that's you know, a, 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 a nonprofit in Boston, doesn't matter. Where you put it is where your heart will be connected. And I love this story in Luke 19. It's the story of Zacchaeus, and I wanna unpack the whole story with you. If you, if you, if you, if you don't know it, Zacchaeus was a, a little man. He was a chief tax collector. He climbed up in a tree to see Jesus. And Jesus walked that way and he saw him. He said, come down, I'm going to your house. Great story, whole song with hand motions. Anyway, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Jesus said, I'm going to your house. I need to meet with you. And Zacchaeus, it says, the chief tax collector stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now, he is, he is the chief tax collector. He was not a follower of Jesus yet. He was beginning a, a transfer from the old covenant to the new covenant. And he says, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. So Jesus said to him, listen to this, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. And what, one of the things among many that I believe we're seeing in this particular passage is not that your generosity saves you, but that people who are saved are generous people. People who have surrendered to Jesus, who've acknowledged and recognized the magnitude of what Jesus has done for them become generous. They become sowers. And the first place that the saved care for is the people who are also walking after God with them. And so my challenge to you, as I told you I would do today, I'm gonna challenge you in the way you've thought about the practice of your generosity, your giving, whether to this church or anywhere, how you've come up with your own system for evaluating what's appropriate, what's enough, what's the place. Like everybody has, has, everybody has a system, 
until they decide to surrender to God's system. Everybody does. Some people give transactionally to anything, church or anything. How'd it go today? Did I like the message? If, if you give based on that, you probably none of you are given today. We give transactionally. Did I like it? Was it good? Did I get what I want? Were people nice to me? Do I agree? Then I'll give. That was not the way the principle of giving was designed. Some of, some of you give based on a cause. I love that we're a part of that. I wanna help with that. In and of itself, that's not wrong. But what about when you don't hear about that cause? Do you decide I don't need to give anything until I hear about that cause again? The principle of giving is to take care of the community of faith to make sure that there's, there's care, discipleship, investment, ministry scope, gathered experience, a place to gather to care for the temple. Like that was all wrapped up in the practice of tzedakah, the, the giving practice of the Old Testament. And so while we don't, we don't live under the law, if you don't give 10%, I don't think that you're going to hell. Please don't hear that. What I do think is that saved people operate out of a place like Jesus was talking about. If your eye is full of light, we're naturally a generous people. The first thing we think to do is care for the house of God. We receive from the house of God. It's a place we meet with the Lord. It's a place communally we, we, we lay hands on one another and pray for this. Like that's where the, the ministry or the business of church happens in the community of faith. And so I wanna challenge you in this way. For some of you, you've never given anything to this church or any church because you've got your own idea about it. I just want to say to you, the Bible, there are 2,300 verses on the subject of giving. It's a lot, more than any other subject. God takes very serious the personal test of your heart in how you handle the seed he's put in your hand. My question to you today is, are you going to continue to live with all of it gathered up in your arms? Because your prayers for more seed are falling on the, on the ears of heaven who are looking at you saying, I would love to, but you don't ever sow. Why would I put more seed in the hands of someone who leaves it all in the garage or tries to keep it all from themselves? So I wanna challenge you to get out of that place. I would suggest that you begin and think of it like the Old Testament. Start somewhere, pick a percentage, pick a portion, and then begin to grow from there as you are both able and as you sense the Lord touching you, tugging on you, like this is easy now. It's become familiar. It doesn't challenge, it doesn't test you, it doesn't cause you to depend on me. Move to the next step. And for those of you who just picked the number and you've been living, maybe it's time to take the next step. For those of you who are tithers, you have consistently given the first. And I, I only use that word as a measure, not as a law. Maybe it's time to say, Lord, where else would you want me to sow seed? Maybe it's not to an offering here, a legacy or anything. Maybe he wants you to support a missionary overseas. Maybe he wants you to invest in supporting a child through one child. Maybe there's, I don't know. I'm just saying our journey with the Lord is a constant surrender and recognition of, Lord, I'm caring for your house. I'm extending the gospel. What else do you want me to do, Lord? The more seed you give to me, the more I'm gonna sow. I want to be a great sower. And I asked you when we started the series, how many of you wanna set up your financial house? House that it extends beyond you and everybody in here put their hand up and I want to say to you this is a cornerstone of your financial house today and for your future God's system perpetuates beyond us so I'm going to pray I'm going to dismiss you and, uh, and let you go and um, uh, we're going to any of you that need prayer I know I said we were going to have some time for that I just I want to meet with you over here in this corner with uh, any of our prayer team okay would you just stand to your feet let me pray for you we've gone long today been a full day Lord we love you Thank you for your grace and mercy in our life, God. Thank you that you're faithful to us when things are hard. Thank you that you're always present when we're walking through dark places. Thank you, God, that you make a way for us when we don't see a way. Thank you, God, that you, you challenge and work on us in ways that we need to be worked on. Thank you, Lord, that you are our rescuer. Thank you that you are our provider. Thank you that you are our protector. Thank you for your mercy and grace, your power and authority, God. We're, we're, in, we're literally standing in recognition and awe of who you are today, God. Lord, as we go our way today, I pray that you would cause the things that we talked about to just challenge us, that we would just work through where we are resistant or reluctant, where we are excited and responsive. God, would you just work on us in this as you do in every area, areas of repentance, areas of forgiveness, areas of patience, areas of, 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 of love and grace. God, like all of them, would you work on us in this, God? Draw us more into a place of responsiveness that the seed you put in our hand becomes seed we sow. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name.
Jesus' name. Now, before you go, if you've never said yes to Jesus, here's what I wanna do real quick. I'm just gonna invite you while everybody's got their heads bowed. If that's you, would you just put your hand up real high in the air and say, David, Pastor David, I, I, don't, I don't know that I've ever surrendered, but I want to right now. If that's you, just go ahead and put your hand up real high. One, two, three. Who would say that's me today? Is there anybody who would say that? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So good. Thank you, God. You're good. So good. Well, as the worship team comes out here, to, we're gonna sing as we go, and I wanna pray over you and just bless you. And then I wanna invite all of our prayer team to come right down here to the front, right over here on this side. Um, yeah, come on out, guys. And uh, let's just, prayer partners, just meet right over here. And if you need prayer, I want you to just start to make your way over here. Let me bless you, and, uh, and we'll sing as you go. I just declare over you a fresh recognition of God's great desire to use you for his purpose. Pray that your eyes would be open to recognize his provision, not your own. I pray that your heart would swell with generosity, that you would see people on street corners and in restaurants and next to you and your neighbors through the lens of how God wants to make you generous with all things on every occasion at all times and that you would experience the full measure of the thanksgiving of God that comes because you do. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray that over you and release you, amen.